Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models episode 79. I'm Steve Kwan, and Matt's not here today. He's actually doing gym renovations, but I would never fly solo on the show, so I have an ultra high quality guest here. Who do we got on the line? Ultra high quality. I don't know about that. <laughs> but uh, my name's Roy Van Vliet. I work with Rob Bernacki on BGJconcepts.net. And more people will know me from the BGJ community as RVV BGJ Online. So. Yeah, and a lot of other people will know you as the Rory that we're always constantly talking shit about on this podcast, especially when Rob's on here. Yeah, there has been some episodes that have gone pretty pretty off the rails. <laughs> You know, it's especially funny because Rory and I have never actually met in person. <laughs> so I think a lot of people assume that Rory is like my arch rival. We've never actually met, but it's just when I, you know, Rob, Rob and Matt seem to have an interesting relationship dynamic with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm good friends with your brother, Matt. I've trained with him quite often. And then obviously Rob Bernacki is one of my best friends, mentors and instructor. And so I guess we kind of know each other in that way. And we've got to like, we've communicated a bunch online now. So I can't, I feel like I know you pretty well, but certainly when we finally get to roll, there's going to be some anger. <laughs> hey, I don't know. I'm going to, I'm planning to stay in quarantine right now for the next two or three years. So it might be a while. Harold, you'll be even worse when I get my hands on you. <laughs> so, um, hey, I, also, you know, we've switched over to remote recording. We'd always recorded in person in the past. And now that we've got the setup and it seems to be working pretty well, it's awesome because we can have guests on more regularly. Although I got to say, Rory, it was a pleasure getting this thing set up with you because it only took like 30 seconds. And our longtime listeners may or may not be aware, but my brother Matt is absolutely incompetent when it comes to using technology like he's just it's unreal he's like a grandfather how bad he is I had him on the line and we kept trying to get the audio quality right and he kept saying that hey the link you sent me doesn't work I can't open it it's not working and I found out after a while that he was using internet explorer of all things <laughs> so, mm -hmm. yeah I'm also not used to just the fact that you sound so crisp and clear and it was easy to set up because, yeah, my other half, Rob, when I work with him, when it comes to video work, as well as we've been doing a podcast for BGJconcepts.net just to try and give a little extra value to our subscribers during this time where they can't be training. And it's, uh, my God, some of the stuff, um, he's, he's older, so he's kind of like my dad in a way where it's hard to just explain some stuff to him, but... He picks it up. So it sounds like we're both dealing with uh, a partner that struggles a bit. They're excellent at jujitsu. Amazing <laughs> at that. But when it comes to technology behind it, eh. it's a different skill set for sure. Something I've learned is that some people just have a knack for this kind of thing, whereas other people just have to be dragged kicking and screaming to use anything even remotely high tech. Yeah. And to be fair, I, I would say it to for their argument's sake, they are both better the better half at jiu-jitsu compared to us where we're pretty good jiu-jitsu as well as also have the we're technologically savvy so I guess. yeah 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 <laughs> i feel like my job is to kind of make sure that matt gets from point a to point b so that he can do all of his jiu-jitsu stuff online <laughs> and to your point it's become a much bigger initiative over the last while right we've significantly ramped up our content schedule and our offerings and it sounds like you guys have too and that's one interesting thing to come out of this pandemic is because there's a lot more time for a lot of us we can use that time to try to provide uh, more and better quality quality online educational material, which is actually what we wanted to talk about today. So Rory, I know that on your side, of course, part of Island Top Team is the BJJconcepts.net Academy, which I know you have a really key role in, as well as all of the other duties that you do at Island Top Team. So maybe talk a little bit first before we get going about what kind of stuff you guys do and what you provide as online materials, just so that people have that context. Absolutely. So BJJconcepts.net is Rob Bernacki's bringing his brain out online and showing all the curriculum that we teach at Island Top Team. So we've wanted to structure it in a way that the curriculum was laid out from a basis from starting from the first video to the last video, everything progressively chained together as a system for people to easily understand the conceptual language that Rob and I teach, as well as being able to consistently stack upon the previous lesson to maximize the effectiveness and efficiency of their learning. 
And so we go through training, like obviously concepts. If you're used to Rob Bernanke's approach to teaching at all, he has a heavy emphasis on the conceptual framework behind jujitsu and helping you guys understand what the moves are. We have a 101 fundamentals program. We have 201 more advanced curriculum where we're going through all these different deep dives of areas like Kimura control, specific guards, passing specific guards, submission, defense, etc. And then the cool thing that I haven't ever seen a website do before is that Rob wanted to have a pedagogy membership, a premium membership on the site that taught people how to be better instructors because... As we'll kind of talk about today, uh, trying to develop your skills as an instructor online, being an instructor and being able to teach is a skill set in itself. And as we've all seen, there are guys that are amazing at jujitsu, but they can't convey that information very well to their students. So just because you're good at jujitsu and being able to execute the techniques and even be able to compete at a high level does not mean that you're a good instructor. We have to have this growth mindset to know that we have to be working on this individual set of skills to make ourselves better while we're also trying to improve our jujitsu. And so bgaconcepts.net has just been a fabulous resource to get to work on and to help Rob really shape and make this uh, come to life to be able to give people a very efficient and effective way to practice their jujitsu and become better instructors. Yeah, I am a big fan of the island top team approach. I mean, I, I'm not actually sure if our listeners know this, but I don't train with you guys. I'm not under the island top team banner. And I actually only discovered the systems relatively recently, I guess about two years ago when Matt wouldn't shut up about them. And I decided at some point I should actually look into it. And I found it very helpful because it kind of put language to a lot of the things that I had sort of independently had to learn myself as I progressed up to black belt. And, you know, once I saw this, it kind of got me thinking that, you know, man, would have really been nice to have this nomenclature and this framework for thinking 10 years ago (laughs) so that I didn't have to trial and error my way through all of this jujitsu. And you brought up a really good point, which is that the art of teaching is totally different from the art of just learning on your own. There's kind of two sides to the coin. And as you get more senior in jujitsu, it becomes more or less inevitable that you are going to take on some responsibility for sharing that knowledge. Even if you never open an academy, even if you never take a formal instruction job in jujitsu, just by virtue of the fact that you get up to black belt, you're going to be providing that knowledge down to the next generation. And so once you hit brown belt, black belt, you find that you start after really exploring this area that is totally different from everything else you've ever done in jujitsu. And like you mentioned, I am personally kind of shocked at how bad a lot of grapplers are at actually teaching. It sure feels to me like a lot of them, they might be legends on the mats, they might be amazing, but their ability to convey that information is often very, very lesser compared to their ability to actually grapple. And I kind of wonder if maybe it's because teaching is inherently a selfless thing, right? You are trying to give back to the people around you. And if you're a pro competitor, you know, you've spent your whole life just thinking about yourself. So when you make that switch to open a gym, suddenly it's about other people. And I feel sometimes like a lot of instructors kind of just half ass it, you know, they, they show up, they show a technique of the day, but they haven't really put a lot of thought into a structure. They don't really pay attention to their students and how they can help them learn. And I think all of those problems are greatly amplified when you take it online because now you don't even have the ability to sit next to the person. And in some cases, it might be a completely one-way conversation, as is often the case with online video. So all of these restrictions and challenges mean that you have to be even better as an instructor if you want to teach online. I agree. And I think another part, and it's not going to be a blanket statement for everybody, but there's a different way that people view ego when it comes to teaching. And so we get very used to it at an early stage in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu that if we can't accept critical feedback and be able to overcome challenges when we're told something doesn't work or we experience when something doesn't work, when we get smashed while rolling, then we're not going to make it very far in Jiu Jitsu. And that's why Jiu Jitsu doesn't really work out for everybody because if you're mm. unable to accept that feedback, you're just going to end up uh, getting pushed away. But if I take, if I see a black belt and he is now considered an expert in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and being able to demonstrate and kill people, basically demonstrate techniques and kill people. Then if they're teaching and I tell them 
or if they were to receive any feedback saying that they're not actually that good at teaching, people will typically start to put their guard back up and they'll start to feel like you're being they're being personally attacked and that we're attacking their overall understanding of jujitsu when really it's just another area of our jujitsu that has to be developed in the same way that we have to develop our guard retention, our guard passing, our submissions, our submission defense. We get that. We're okay with the fact that we have to go through these different belts with, with it. But then when it comes to teaching, I find people just become a little more egotistical and thinking that they're already good at it, that they don't need to improve and accepting feedback when it comes to trying to teach. And I was guilty of it as well, where it's, you just feel it's a little more personal in the style that you're trying to do, even if you're not very good at it and you're trying to learn. For some reason, it typically stings a little bit more when people criticize your teaching rather than your jujitsu technique. Yeah, because it's almost like a an intellectual thing at that point, right? Yes. And it gets a it very, very closely brushes up to the ego. And I agree with you a hundred percent. One of the things about martial arts that is always brought up as one of the key benefits is how it will teach you confidence, right? And that makes sense. I mean, if you're learning how to defend yourself, you're getting in shape, that's going to give you confidence. But one thing that I have noticed about the martial arts is that confidence can be a double-edged sword because people then sometimes take that confidence and start getting overly confident in other areas of life and other disciplines. And I think you see this a lot with a lot of the really, really famous high ranking black belts where they just think they're just the greatest, not just at jujitsu, but often at everything, you know, they espouse philosophy and all sorts of things that really they're not necessarily the most qualified to bring up or to discuss. And teaching is very much a situation like that where, yeah, these guys might be legendary grapplers. They might be a amazing when it comes to actually rolling, but that confidence also falsely bleeds over to their ability to teach and they think they're better than they are. And because they're so good at grappling, they've lost that beginner's mind where they can be open to feedback. Their ego kind of hardens and solidifies. And that is one thing I, I found that as you get more experienced in the martial arts, you have to be very wary of is to understand that just because you're individually good at grappling, that does not translate to your ability to communicate that knowledge to somebody else absolutely it's an entirely different area so just like somebody that has done 20 years of brazilian jiu-jitsu if they stepped into a striking martial art they're going to be completely garbage at it and when you got somebody even if it's within a different grappling sport like wrestling or judo and they come into brazilian jiu-jitsu while they're going to be able to progress quite quickly they're still going to theoretically be starting as a white belt depending on what their skills are because they have to now learn what's going on with this now their understanding is going to allow them to progress faster and so i would hope that a black belt in brazilian jiu-jitsu that just finally starts to get introduced into teaching if for some reason they're a late bloomer when it comes to that they're going to be able to progress faster because they already have the existing skill set and knowledge that now they just really have to learn how to almost do the what we consider like a performance aspect of the teaching being able to actually control the room publicly speak mm -hmm. and know how to break the information down to pass it on to students versus say obviously a white belt who's now trying to learn everything at the same time and it's why we always scold white belts for trying to teach other white belts but at the same time like it's one of those things that we've all done it at mm -hmm. every single belt when we're partnering up with somebody and we think that they're having an issue with something it's we're trying to help them and that's what you're talking about like everybody wants to try and help people and so i mean obviously damage can be done at earlier stages and so why we try and shut it down but it's part of the process and i'm i'm fine with it like going on but if i'm nearby call me over as the instructor rather than trying to just pull it out of your ass and uh try and coming up with these answers but they're always gonna be trying to help each other and so as you're moving up the ranks like blue vault i was constantly trying to teach around the class or even just be an assistant instructor to Rob or teach while Rob was supervising so that I was going to be able to try and parrot the information to everybody. And if I got hung up with questions that I didn't know how to answer, Rob's right there to got, uh, to have my back and be able to get in there and answer while also ensuring that the students know that there is a capable instructor there, that they still have that black belt quality level of instruction there, rather than having, say, blue belts run the class, which is what we typically end up seeing at uh, not every gym, but there's a lot of gyms where it's like, what, depending on who you have as students, it's easy just to get your blue belts to run the class for a free membership and stuff like yeah. that. And that's becomes a whole bunch of other predatory business practices that I don't like. But uh, yeah, it at least gets the students they're teaching, but I think it's always good to have them practicing while they have a more qualified person right beside them to assist. 
Yeah, Rob talked about this on one of our earlier podcasts where he mentioned, and I know that his general principle is he doesn't like to have white belts basically trying to teach. He'd always rather have people cede to the black belt. And I'm kind of of two minds of this. At the time when we talked about it, I didn't agree with that philosophy and neither did Matt, right? Because the reality is, even though a white belt technically doesn't know as much as you do, sometimes their ignorance can actually lead to really interesting insights that you might have closed your mind to years ago. But on the other hand, now I've kind of come to maybe warm up a little bit more to Rob's stance because the reality is it, um, have you ever heard of the saying Brandolini's law? I discovered this relatively recently, but basically, basically what it says is it takes a lot more effort to refute bullshit than it does to create it, right? So the problem is any moron can open their mouth and say something that's not true. And if you want to then go and systematically debunk it, it takes a lot more effort. And in a jujitsu gym, if you've got 30 white belts and they're all trying to be the instructor, they can say silly things in a matter of seconds and it might take you as the instructor a lot of effort to roll it back. So I'm kind of of two minds on this where on one hand you want to encourage open discourse, but you also need to make sure that people understand the limits of their knowledge and don't try to teach beyond their means and know how to defer to expertise when they're out of their depth. And that's not even necessarily a rank based thing. I mean, I don't know about you, Rory, but when I was a white belt and even a blue belt, I sort of assumed that when I was a black belt, I would know everything. But one thing that I find constantly shocking at the black belt level is I actually don't know that much about jujitsu. Like there are wide aspects of the game that I just don't really play. And I try to funnel things back to the game I want to play. And what that means is like, let's take spider guard, for example. I know how to defend spider guard. I have no problem with that. But If you were to ask me to attack Spider Guard, I probably couldn't even think of how to do it because it's been so long since I've actively used that strategy. So it's that's one of the interesting things about jiu-jitsu that I find is that even at the more experienced levels, you can't possibly know everything or be good at everything. So you've got to juggle all of these variables in your head. And that I think comes back to what you mentioned, which is that when you're the instructor, you have to learn to have a bit of humility and understand that you don't know everything and you're going to have to improve in certain areas, right? You're probably going to have to do homework to refresh yourself on things that you may have forgotten. And you're certainly going to need to work on your ability to teach and to communicate information because that is traditionally not taught as part of jujitsu. Yeah, I totally agree. There's certain times where I get asked a question that if somebody says like, hey, I really want to learn this advanced Baron Bolo stuff. And I'll just say, I'm not the guy to learn that from that. Like I have a basic understanding of Baron Bolo stuff so that I can counter it, but it's not personally something that I've spent a lot of time on as you can't equally learn every single aspect of this extremely complicated game. And I completely agree with you with the whole white belt uh, kind of analogy that you're talking about where like I would, I look at it as like when you're a child And you just look up to adults and you're like, man, they know everything. And then you're like 20 and you're like, holy crap, I need an adult. And then you're like, (laughs) I'm an adult. Shit, I don't know anything. And you realize that we're just all winging this shit until we eventually die because no one knows everything. And so it's really important to know what your strengths are, teach to those strengths. And if you don't know certain topics that you're not trying to teach that stuff. And I think that's like a very important thing when we're, we're looking at like online instruction now where people are, especially during this pandemic, more people than ever are jumping out at this opportunity to try and reach people because it can become a business in itself, but you're also then able to remotely reach your students for when times where we're unable to interact personally. And we want to be careful about the information that we're putting out there because then we're also opening ourselves up to a lot more scrutiny, which can be a really good thing. It can also be demoralizing at times, Mm -hmm. but if you're trying to teach something that you are not good at teaching, then you're going to potentially do damage to students that are going to be learning something bad, but you're also going to be damaging just your brand and your name as an instructor. If people see that as like, Holy crap, like Ari is teaching this absolute garbage on submissions one oh one. And like, we can't actually, uh, you just lose the respect for that person as like an instructor. So, yeah, it's, it's as the saying goes, right? The internet is like a swimming pool. Once you pee in it, <laughs> you, you can't get the pee back out of it. And that's the challenge when you 
put your voice out there and you try to share knowledge, if you share incorrect information and you exceed the level of authority that you're supposed to have, you open yourself up to a lot of that criticism. Now, on one hand, that criticism can be powerful because that is what helps you get better. But on the other hand, it also makes you aware of the burden of putting quality, correct information out there versus just trying to wing it. And this is an obstacle that any content creator is going to be very familiar with, unless you're making something that is basically like a, you know, like a fictional work, then maybe it's not the same. But when you're trying to provide educational or informational materials, I definitely feel this. And I mean, we've at BJJ Mental Models received this kind of feedback before, which is that people love the podcast, but when we go kind of into areas like, for example, the cults episode that we did with Rob, a lot of the feedback that we got on that was that, yeah, that's great and all, but people would have really preferred it if we actually had like Stephen Hassan or an actual like cult expert on the show, because otherwise you're kind of losing having that voice who really, really speaks with authority on the subject. And no matter how much homework you do and how much research you do, you can't be that guy unless you've put 10 or 20 years of your life into it. So it is a challenge and there's a massive burden of quality on people who put information out there. And one of the nice things about the internet is that if you do put out garbage information, you tend to get called out pretty quickly. For that reason, and and also just the fact that it's hard to teach people something like jujitsu online, I think that on one hand, this pandemic has opened up a lot of opportunities for new business models that probably people never even thought would be viable in the past. But on the other hand, it's a lot harder to teach when you're not standing next to someone, and it's especially hard in a very kinetic subject like jujitsu. And Rory, I'm curious to know because as a, you know, as a podcaster myself who does similar material, I have my own feelings on this. But from your perspective, what are some of the big challenges that you encounter when you're trying to teach people jiu-jitsu online as opposed to in person? So the first thing is that you're going to even if you got good at instructing to a group where you're able to read the audience and you get used to speaking directly to people, making eye contact with them, it becomes completely nerve wracking once you're put in front of a camera. And that was the first thing that was very hard for me to get used to was just looking into the camera lens, looking into the camera lens that then you're theoretically making eye contact with the viewer who's looking at the monitor, because if you keep breaking eye contact, it kind of becomes disjointed and getting comfortable with the idea that like, if you screw up on camera, it's locked in there and it doesn't actually matter if you stumble, no one actually cares. But for some reason, we really focus on that. Like if I make a mistake while teaching at a seminar, people just will laugh for a second or I'll just I'll catch myself and I'll quickly uh, correct my my whether it's audible pauses or just me miss uh, misspeaking and choosing the wrong word. Nobody will even really notice besides me. I'll be my own toughest critic. And once I record it, it's set there. And so it gets like, you have to get just experience for one, being in front of the camera and getting used to teaching and then getting used to the idea as well that you don't have the ability to reach out to people as easily or to have them just ask questions right there live to be able to correct things. So whether it's so, a student not understanding something properly based on the information that you gave, whether it was your own mistake as the instructor or the student just missed something or you're planning on being able to follow up within like while people are drilling everything. I don't have that luxury and I can answer some questions in like a YouTube or Reddit comment section, but it really doesn't do it justice to try and have these things go over text. So you want to try and over deliver in videos is how Rob and I look at it because you have the ability to rewind this stuff and to be able to view it over and over again if you want. So I want to try and get everything out there as much as possible. I want to try and show multiple angles so that you have the best chance of viewing this video, even if it was one time through and understanding it to the best of your ability. I, while they're very popular and they can be very helpful for people for like just creating like a, a spark of an idea or creating food for thought where just doing like a super quick video showing something like, oh, look at this cool kiss of the dragon from reverse El Hiva to reverse X into a inside Senkaku 411 leg lock position. 
to someone like me, I can watch that. And with my conceptual understanding as a black belt, I can look at that and I can start replicating it almost immediately because I'll know exactly what I need to do. But I already have such an abundance of information that it's easy for me to figure that out. But a white belt watching that's going to just be blown away by it. They're going to think it's so cool, but they're not going to have any idea of how to replicate that. And they're going to do a horrible job trying to replicate it if they chase the techniques down the YouTube rabbit hole, which we've all been guilty of, is trying to find the best techniques or something that's going to fix our, all our problems just in this one YouTube video or as this instructional that we paid for. So we want to know what our strengths are when we're teaching, and we want to try and think about the ways that we have to adjust this when we start putting this onto cameras and actually recording it to film and putting it out online. And so that's what's going to help you also then create your identity as an instructor, because as we talk about this stuff, it can be quite overwhelming or it could feel like, well, it's too late at 2020 for me to get into the YouTube game or to start posting videos online because so many other people are doing it. And the thing is, is that there is a demand for it that is increasing. And there are still many different ways that things can be taught. Like I'm obviously very biased to the way that Rob teaches. I love it. But there are people that do not like Rob as a person. They do not like the humor that he uh, has in his videos. They don't like the conceptual framework and how we label things because whether they're just ignorant and they don't know any better or they are they just have a different taste to how they want to learn that's fine and then there's people that will then prefer me to rob because they'll find that i'm a little bit like i can teach some of the, the techniques to for the most part to the same level as rob but i have a different restrained kind of humor and a different kind of personality when i'm filming but then there's people that are not going to like me and they'll prefer Danaher's approach or they'll prefer Ryan Hall. Or they'll prefer even the shorter videos. So whatever your way that you really want to learn that you like to teach, it's finding a way that you can obviously develop certain core principles of the pedagogy skills to make sure that you are a good instructor, but then still having your own voice and authenticity to how you like to present the information. And people will naturally come towards you with that. Like the, the idea that I always got pushed towards me when I was going through like learning about YouTube and studying this stuff behind the scenes to become better at how I'm going to be producing not only my own videos, but know how to play the games better to try and get subscribers and retain viewers is you think about Starbucks and McDonald's and we think about how ridiculous it is that there's can be a Starbucks on almost every corner in a big city or every McDonald's, you'll always not be that far away from one of them. And you think like, this is ridiculous how many coffee shops there are in this area, but they're there and they're able to survive because there is such a demand that it's doesn't really matter if you think that there's an overabundance of instructors online. If you have something that you feel you can bring to the table that people are going to enjoy, then you should absolutely do it. It's going to be a long journey and there's a lot to learn from it. And that's some of the stuff that we've been talking about now and we'll probably cover as uh, more thoroughly. But I want to encourage people that if you have any interest in recording yourself and start putting it out there for people, play to your strengths and get to it. Yeah. And one thing that I would chime on to that as well is be open about your limitations, because if you yes. speak authoritatively about everything, like you're just the expert on every single matter, then you open yourself up rightfully to very severe criticism. But if you go out there and you just flat out admit, hey, this, these are the things I know. These are the things I'm not sure about. And you kind of couch that so that the listener on the other side has an understanding of exactly how authoritative you are on the matter. Then there really isn't a good reason for someone to criticize you because you've been open about these things. And and it's okay if you're more on the junior side to put content out there as long as you also couch it with the limitations of your knowledge, which is always a good practice. I think a lot of people at more junior levels are kind of afraid to put things out there because they think, oh man, I'm not a black belt. But if you explain the limitations of your knowledge, this is the mistake that Ari Bolden made, right? Is it's okay to put a YouTube video up and try to invent some crazy choke. But if you come across and present yourself as more of an authority on the matter than you actually are, that's where you open yourself up to that feedback. But if you just come out there and say, hey, I'm just a white belt. I'm just a blue belt. I'm not an expert by any means, but here's something cool I've been playing with. What do you guys think? I mean, you're not going to be crucified for doing that, right? You will actually probably get a lot of value because people might come in and provide you with insights that you didn't think about. 
So something that you brought up, which I think is actually pretty poignant, is the fact that when you go online, um, first of all, there's kind of two sides to the coin when it comes to feedback from your your audience. When you're in person, if you are teaching something and people are getting stuck, it's very easy to identify that, right? Like if you're doing a seminar and you teach some crazy complicated technique and you can tell that like half of the people just don't get it, well, you'll know that right away and you can stop and you can change course. But when you're doing something online, you lose that ability to do that because you don't so easily have access to just body language, right? It can be very hard to look at your audience and see are they understanding this or not. And in the case of like a YouTube video, you don't have that option at all or an online academy, right? You might not have that option. You've got one shot to make this content and to make it resonate. And that kind of ties back to what you were saying, which is that when you're in person and you're speaking, if you make a mistake, it's usually not the end of the world. And Funny you mentioned this because this was advice that I got on public speaking, which is that if you make a mistake, don't like freeze up or stutter or stop and try to reset. Just keep barreling on like it never happened, right? Because these moments are fleeting in a conversation. People misspeak all the time. People say ums and, you know, they say things that maybe they didn't want to say in that manner, but you just correct yourself and you move on. You don't think about it. But when you're making an online video, you know, it, the situation is very different because you're making something that is going to be archived and people can watch and review later. And that changes the burden on you in terms of getting it right the first time because people are going to come back and cite this as a reference and this is something that (laughs) Matt and I have had to put a lot of thought into because when we launched the podcast for example this is not live like I can spend the next two weeks editing the hell out of this and make it just perfect if I want to but when you do something like a live stream then it becomes a much different problem (laughs) because then it is much more along the lines of a regular in-person conversation with the caveat that it's still out there and it's probably still being archived and people might watch it back. So it does make for an interesting dynamic because again, you can't see the audience. You can't see what they're reacting to. But on top of that, there's also a degree of permanence that you don't encounter in regular day-to-day conversation. Absolutely. And it's important to look at this as just everything is developing skills. And when you first do this, you do this as a passion project. You do this because you want to and you want to continue to get better, not only as a jujitsu practitioner and an instructor, but also as a content creator to whatever extent that is. So like you said, you could teach as a blue belt or a purple belt online as long as it's done in a responsible way and you kind of provide that caveat of being uh, not necessarily the authority at something. But there are guys that are purple belts that might be a purple belt at overall jujitsu, but they are arguably brown belt to black belt level at certain passes, certain submissions. This is why we have competitive purple belts that are winning at IBJJF Worlds could probably beat the crap out of most hobbyist black belts because their game while it is narrow it is extremely well crafted and this is why they're able to perform at such a high level but there are guys that like there are blue belts and white belts that just vlog and they just document their journey there are people that do interviews and like the uh just they'll talk to other people and they'll have these different kind of methods of how they're creating content so it doesn't only have to be just you instructing So the other thing that I wanted to talk about here was then looking at it as developing skills. So it's really cool for me when I look back at my first YouTube videos, while they do suck in a way and they make me cringe at the same time, it shows me how far I've already come as an instructor being comfortable talking to a mic or into a camera, but also just my video quality production. And so you don't need much to get started. Like I don't want to tell you guys to ever spend a bunch of money. Most people have a smartphone. And a smartphone can already record at HD quality 1080p, which is, I would say, the minimum that you need for any kind of videos that you're putting out online. YouTube is what I'm more specialized in, so I'll keep referencing to that as the example. But as long as you can produce HD quality video and your audio isn't complete garbage so that you could buy a Rode shotgun microphone for like the video micro is about $60 Canadian drastically increases your sound so you can direct it towards you when you're teaching like at your gym or in the room your studio whatever you're using and that's all you need 
obviously something to hold it stable. So like that could be a tripod with a little phone holder, but honestly, like I've done it with books where you just stack a bunch of books or like a box and you rest it up against it so that it's able to record you. You don't need much to get started, especially when we're talking about this kind of idea like YouTube online in general, where this stuff is free. You and I have talked about this, Steve, where like upping production quality is important when we start looking at actually making a financial gain from this, where we're actually asking people to pay money to subscribe or to purchase products, then you got to step it up. But when it comes to just free and you're putting the stuff out there, get out there, start doing it and work on improving, learn more about video and audio. So like filmmaking, like I was taking courses on learning more about just like frame rates and ISO and shutter speed and the difference of the recording codecs and stuff like that and how to properly frame shots and then working on studying more about audio and how to like kind of scrub through EQ and take out like the audible, like the ugly pitches and tones within your audio tracks and then how to export it properly and then studying the stuff of YouTube of just knowing how to tag your videos properly so that you can place well in search rankings so that people are more likely to find your content, knowing how that game works. And then that stuff is different from YouTube to Instagram to Facebook to whatever other video hosting websites are out there at the time of this video or when you guys are listening to this in the future. It's important to learn this stuff because I've seen guys so often, I keep track of it because it's kind of one of those whether it's egotistical or just like showing that I'm growing and getting better and I'm on the right path is I watch people that have had more subscribers than me or less subscribers than me that are even better instructors than me or have better content in other ways than me. And I keep following them over the two years that I've been doing this now. And I watch them either burn out because they're just not getting the feedback, the rewarding of constantly gaining subscribers or getting the engagement of their videos and I keep seeing myself growing and passing these people just because I'm I'm studying how to play this game properly. And I know the importance of regular consistent uploads versus just erratically uploading videos all over the place. And I've learned how to tag videos better than I used to so that I have a higher chance of placing on, once again, a search engine so that people will find my videos over others. And playing this as a long game and improving my skills to just make sure that I'm constantly getting better than I was the previous day before. Yeah, yeah. I can relate to that perfectly. And it's like you said, I think a lot of people, maybe they're afraid of putting out something where the production quality is not perfect. And you got to be careful not to let perfect become the enemy of the good (laughs) where you're so afraid of knocking it out of the park the first time that you're afraid to even take that first step. I mean... If you go back to BJJ Mental Models episode one, like Matt and I at the time had absolutely no idea. It sounded awful. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and and I, this is after, like, once I kind of learned how to podcast, I went back and applied that knowledge to try to sweeten the audio, but there's just nothing you can do. Like, we had no idea how to record. We assumed that podcasting was, oh, well, you just put like a mic in front of yourself and you just talk. We had no understanding of acoustics, of editing of all of the tools that are involved, of what is required to set up and run a podcast. It was really, really eye-opening in terms of how hard it is to just get decent quality audio. And the challenge that I have now is that people, like BJJ Mental Models is not like a current event show. When we get new listeners, they usually start at episode one and listen all the way up. And when people do that, I just think, fuck. (laughs) I hope they stay. (laughs) I hope, yeah, exactly. Like to the point where, and I've seen other people do this, to the point where I I've been tempted to go back and re-edit episode one and put a preamble at the beginning where I basically say, look, guys, I I promise that if you hang in there for like 10 more episodes, it's going to get a lot better. Um, But that said, though, it was the fact that we took that first awkward step that allowed us to get to the point where we are now. um, And we're quite happy to see how things have grown and things, you know, get better and better with every new week that we release an episode. And to your point, the amount that I've learned just in terms of how this game works works is incredible like I had no idea audio was as complicated as it was when we did our first episode I assumed oh well I'll just 
take this like $30 blue snowball mic that my wife has and plug it in and I'll just yak into it. No, audio is way more complicated than you think it should be. And video, I'm sure, is even more complicated. So even for someone like me who works in tech, the amount I've learned over the past year and a half just living in this space, it's really improved. Actually, not just my understanding of how to podcast, but also my understanding of how to be an instructor, of how to speak publicly. It's even actually helped me on the job because the fact that I now have a degree of knowledge in the podcast space makes me a valuable resource at work for people who are looking to move into that space. So it's definitely a situation where, yeah, of course you want to strive for the highest quality possible, but you don't want to let perfection become such a a goal that you're afraid to even take that first step because it's all about like just like with jujitsu you're not going to be perfect on day one you got to take that first step acknowledge that you made mistakes and then grow from that and get better the next time and just create that positive feedback loop where you're always getting better and always getting better and before you know it I mean within six months to a year you'll probably be at the point where your production value and the quality of your content is at a level that most people would consider to be pretty top-notch I agree there is when Rob and I started bjjconcepts.net I had never played with a camera I knew nothing about it Rob had gotten some advice from a few people and I think mostly Stefan Kesting on just the camera to buy and a cheap shotgun microphone to use we had a crappy tripod and we just started recording now the quality itself from a video production standpoint is not great and I cringe looking back at it but obviously the content that Rob is able to bring forth was amazing and so even in that instance we were charging money and people still loved it so like your content is more important than the the quality of those videos like it doesn't matter if you have 4k video with a uh, high quality audio if the content is lacking it doesn't matter so any thing that i've spent money on for courses when it comes to being an online creator content is king is the message that is always carried forward so if you got something that's worth bringing to the table then do it try and do it in a, a quality that is somewhat acceptable to whatever today's standard is at the time of you listening to this but it doesn't have to be 4k you don't have to have crazy lighting you don't have to have like crazy microphone and boom stands set up if it is able to be digested then it is absolutely worth putting out there and then from there over this last two years i have been improving my skills as a filmmaker which then as you had just talked about steve like i've had people comment on how much better i am as an instructor just when i'm teaching classes because i'm getting so used now to one taking videos having more of a plan before I speak and just speaking more confidently that then it's carried itself into the class. And then when it comes to just outside stuff, like you said, we have more worth now for what we can offer at the different jobs that we do. I am getting paid to do photography shoots just because as I've been working primarily on improving my ability to record video with that, I was really taking pictures a lot as well of jujitsu. And then I was just going out and challenging myself to take pictures of landscapes or animals, etc. because it got me working with my camera and learning the ins and outs of that camera. And so if I could take pictures better, it would also help translate, not cover everything, but it would help translate my skills to be able to taking video. And so now I'm, I'm getting paid to do photography gigs, which Two years ago, once again, I'd never touched a camera. I never would have thought I would have been going down these different paths of enjoyment just as a hobby, then also being able to make money from it. And it's led to other financial gains for me. Well, one, it's led to people actually knowing who the hell I am, which no one knew who the hell I was two years ago. And while it's only 9,000 subscribers on YouTube and I by no means consider myself like an expert or like a success story, I am getting to a point where I, I'm quite happy with where I've been progressing and the level that I've gotten to, and I'm excited to see what the future holds. And it's allowed, like, Gold BGJ reached out to me. They've sponsored me. They send me free gear. I actually record instructionals for them for their online website, and so I make money from that, and it's been a fantastic relationship with those guys. I love their products. I love working with them. And then Stefan Kesting, a guy that I bought his instructionals 11 years ago when I first started jiu-jitsu, I had the opportunity to record a guard retention instructional with him. And like, it's crazy to think that someone that is such a legend of the instruction of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and has helped the community so much, I was able to actually develop a relationship, which started first through Rob, because Rob Bernacki recorded a bunch of instructionals with Stefan, but to actually reach a, a level of confidence 
that Stefan's able to look at my videos that I record and go, you know what? I actually want to work with Rory and I want to pay him for this. And it was amazing to have that kind of opportunity. And this was stuff that didn't start paying dividends until like a year and a half into recording these videos because the first year and a half of YouTube, I didn't have my videos monetized. You can't monetize until you have 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch hours on your channel. I didn't want to start having ads on my videos right away because I wanted to build a little more good faith with the subscribers. Like making five cents a month wasn't worth the risk of putting a bunch of ads in front of people before they watch my videos. So I wanted to make sure that they could watch my videos ad free and enjoy the content and become hooked hopefully at what I'm being able to provide them. And then now I've turned on ads. Once again, through this, I've made maybe like four or $500 in the last like eight months because a few of my videos went a little more viral. But on average, I'm making $30 a month from YouTube. And like I was saying, this has to be a passion project. You have to play a long game with this and you have to be working on honing your skills as a filmmaker, as well as a jujitsu practitioner and instructor to get worth out of this. Because if you're doing this, I find a lot of people want to do this stuff because they're excited about the idea of having an online business to be able to make money. And holy crap, you are not going to make shit from this for a very long time. And even including the money that I've made from Stefan Casting and Gold BGJ, Honestly, for the amount of time that I've put into stuff over the last two years, it would be a very poor return of investment if that's how I measured the success. But by building my notoriety within the jiu-jitsu community, by just even being able to reach people, when you get those engaging comments where people comment on your videos and they're like, this was awesome, this really helped make this technique click for me, thank you so much, that makes it worthwhile. And being able to look through this library of the 150 or so videos that I've done so far and see where I've come from beginning to my latest video it's been a very rewarding uh, thing to get to be a part of. Yeah, yeah. That's a really, really great point, which is that when you, you know, if you want to launch, I don't want to say this applies to every type of business, but especially if you want to do a, like a content based business, you've got to be willing to accept the fact that it financially, you're going to eat shit for like the first few years, <laughs> right? Like it, it is definitely a challenge because even if you're growing at a really good clip, like even if you're growing 10% a month, which is awesome, the reality is that it's going to be a long time before those 10% gains grow to something relatively large. And if you look at a lot of really successful content creators, you'll find very few of them were overnight successes. That's not to say it never happens, but most of them, they started off with a very small audience and they grew it over time. And yeah, if you want to get into something like this, you've got to understand that there does have to be passion as a primary driver because it will be a while before you make any sort of meaningful money off of it, let alone enough to do it as your full-time job, right? It can take years and years and years if you ever get there at all. But I like your earlier point where you mentioned that like the quality of the production does not need to be perfect. We live in a YouTube world now. Like it is totally acceptable to record content on a phone and have that go viral and have millions and millions of viewers. Like the, the quality of the production is not necessarily a barrier to entry, but the quality of the content is. So you can record something on a garbage camera or with a garbage microphone that might be distracting to people. But at the end of the day, the content being top quality is the thing that's going to differentiate you so as long as you can structure that that's really the most important thing to target and yeah you brought up a good point too about things like advertisement like we've decided at this point that we want to focus on growth and not so much on revenue when it comes to especially doing a podcast so it's a tough decision at what point you monetize because i i think people don't quite understand exactly how monetization works on like a platform like podcasting or like online video you know you need to be playing with very large numbers of viewers before that actually is going to equate to a lot of money but the things like sponsorships and the relationships that you build and just the growth of your reputation is one of the things that makes it worthwhile, especially at an early stage. And I can absolutely relate to your story because I've had similar situations where people that I have respected for years come to me out of the blue and they start asking me questions about like systems thinking and mental models. And it's like, holy shit, like some of these people who message me, they're like, you know, multi-degree black belts that I've been following for 10 years. And now suddenly not only do they know who I am, but they want my feedback on something. And that's really more motivating than 
any financial incentive that you could receive to feel like you've given back to the community to the point where some of the the biggest players in the community are now interested in what you have to say i mean once you get to that point even before you start making any big financial gains that to me is one of the big motivating drivers for putting content like this out there i love it is why i've been able to continue pushing through this because i have had a couple times as i was doing videos and I've been, one of the things that I've been very hard on myself to be consistent with is uploading one video a week for YouTube because YouTube rewards consistency, knowing that you are constantly putting out content there and that you're pulling people in. Even if the numbers are low, it'll be easier to find you as a content creator if you're uploading regularly. And so there are times where it was hard for me to think of ideas or come up with videos for that week. And times where I just was thinking like, you know what? maybe just fuck it. I don't care anymore. And I'm going to take like a month off from this or I'm going to uh, stop doing it entirely because you have six, I have 67 subscribers at the time and every video gets like four views. And so like for looking at it from like this engagement perspective, I'm just like, what am I doing? It's almost embarrassing to say I have a YouTube channel and then somebody would click on it and see that there's nobody actually there and nobody's watching. But I had to keep myself motivated to know that it's like, well, no, I'll try and find another way that I can improve my skills and know that I am getting better at all these different things. And then hopefully the engagement comes later. And then also being okay with the idea that even if I only have 67 subscribers, then are those 67 subscribers engaged? And are they actually watching it? If they are, and if they're loving the content, then I mean, there's 67 more people I'm reaching in different parts of the world, probably, than I would otherwise just teaching at Island Top Team all the time. Like I'm on Vancouver Island, British Columbia, Canada. It is a small little area. There are not a lot of people that are doing jujitsu. I don't have that much of a reach. And that's the exciting part about this change in technology and this online instruction is that we can reach people across the world. And so like I was talking about with Gold BGJ, here's a company in the United States that reached out to me. I've never actually met them but I've had lots of conversations with them and I record content for them. I provide it to them. They send me payment. They send me gear and we keep chatting back and forth. And it's been a fantastic relationship where I would never have had this opportunity to work with them. And surprisingly, as I learned from another phone call that I had had with uh, the, the founders is that for all their instructors, I am the only instructor that is in just a different part of the world. And all their other videos you can tell are recorded at their home studio with the gold BGJ logos and they're filmed with their own cameras and with them. And I had asked why I was the only person that I saw that I was recording from somebody else. And they just said just outright that I was the only person that they reached out to that felt confident to be able to be good at jujitsu, teach jujitsu, record the content themselves and edit it, provide a finished product and upload it for them on their website. And so by having all these different skills, I was able to actually meet the needs that they wanted. And I have had some financial gain as well as getting a bunch of free geese and gear and stuff to try when they're making new products. And it's been fucking amazing. I love it. And I love working with them where there's probably other guys that are more qualified to be instructors on their website than myself personally. And they missed an opportunity because they did not have these skills developed. Yeah, and the only way you're going to get those skills, like you mentioned, is consistency. And you had a really good point about YouTube's algorithms. And I mean, this, I don't know how much you know about this, Rory, but this this is actually my wheelhouse. I'm, I'm an exec at a company that focuses on working with companies like YouTube and other digital video companies. And people don't understand the importance of consistency. Like, you can have every advantage coming out of the gate, but if you can't make content consistently, then you're never going to establish traction and you're never or if you do you're never going to be able to maintain it I actually liken this a lot to how people train jujitsu where you'll start off as a white belt and yeah maybe you're not the biggest strongest most athletic guy and maybe there's someone there who is but if they're not consistent you're going to lap them pretty quickly right and I think all of us who have been around on the mats for a long time have seen this where some just uber athlete comes into jiu-jitsu and they're crushing everyone at white belt just because they're such a freak athlete but they're not consistent and they burn out and then before you know it these little computer nerds are just tapping them left and right because they're consistent and consistency is one of the most important habits that you can build if you want to get good at anything and it can be hard because just like with jiu-jitsu 
if you're doing online content, when you start out, it's going to be bad and you're not going to have a lot of people who follow you and it takes a while to build an audience. So there might be a year, two years, three, four, maybe even five years where you just don't have that traction or you're only speaking to a very, very small group of people like close friends and family. But eventually, if you keep at it, as long as you're making smart decisions and you have a good strategy, you'll start to see that traction snowball. And man, if you're getting like 10% growth every month, like eventually, even if you start off with a very small number, eventually that's going to add up to something really, really significant as long as you're consistent. So that's that's really the one takeaway that I would have for anyone who wants to establish a presence online and has something valuable that they feel they want to share out there is to just be consistent about it and don't expect those big overnight numbers. I would also say that and you brought this up perfectly, it's not so much about the number of people that you have who listen to your stuff. It's about the number of true fans that you have, like the number of truly engaged people. And these two numbers are very, very different. Like if you've got millions of people who watch your show, that's great. But what you really want are people who are actually truly engaged. Because for all you know, like people could just be playing this thing in the background and not paying attention to what you're saying and not listening to what you're saying. You want people who are really there to listen to you and that you can then build a relationship with and create a community with. There's a a really seminal article that was written by a guy named Kevin Kelly and it's called 1000 True Fans. I highly recommend anyone interested in online content Content, read this article. Just Google 1000 true fans and it'll be the first thing that you find. Where basically he talks about how if you want to succeed online, you don't need to have millions and millions of followers. That is not the goal. The goal is you need at least 1000 true fans who are engaged with you. They listen to you. You can build a relationship with them because that is enough of a base that you can, you can work with them to provide quality product. You can monetize. They're interested, not just in buying something and disappearing, but they're interested in your own personal success. That's really the main milestone that you want to get to. If you want to be successful is to have at least a thousand people who are really super engaged with what you're doing. That's the more important thing than some vanity metric about how many total subscribers you have. And it really comes down to also knowing the community. So like you were saying, it's you're probably not going to be getting like those Peter McKinnon numbers and being able to rise up to a million subscribers within the first year. It's not possible in jujitsu right now as uh, the current numbers of people training. Like Stefan Kesting ha- has been doing this since like the beginning of YouTube, basically. 12 or 13 years and he's at about i think like 330 350,000 subscribers you got gracie university where henner and heron have i think they've broken 400 but like these are guys that are like big names that have been out for a long time that have built a massive gathering so that is kind of like the pinnacle where guys like peter mckinnon that are like breaking 4 million subscribers or the guys that are breaking even higher than that They got way like these are the guys that are covering technology. They're covering world events and stuff like that, where you got a ton of people that are interested in this stuff. How many people have a smartphone? Almost everybody. How many people actually train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? It's such a small part of the everybody uh, in the population. So you got to know that you're working with a small group. And so especially as a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu instructor, creating any kind of BGJ content, you're going to have a much smaller group that you're reaching out to. And then you got to know how the community works. It's a small group, but it is a passionate vocal group as well. And so if you don't know how certain kind of subgroups work, like say, let's talk about Reddit for a second. Reddit is about 200,000 people on the BGJ forum and they are a passionate group and they kind of, there's kind of like a, a pecking order of rules that happen there that aren't necessarily listed where like they want to know that if you you are there contributing as a community member, you are engaging with other people, you are posting stuff that isn't just your own, you are in commenting on stuff that isn't just your own, you're trying to help people. One of the things that I had learned quite quickly is that just by posting your own videos and not really engaging in other stuff, they don't like that. Unless you were like John Danaher and you already have like this high level of uh, notoriety where people are like you're a celebrity and they want to engage with you then you obviously can break some of these rules but like there's a guy right now that is constantly posting almost every day on reddit his own videos the videos are crap for one which doesn't help but he never posts anything else in reddit he barely replies to the stuff 
the odd comment that does happen within his own videos, which are usually just criticisms. And so just posting it to Reddit over and over again, he's actually starting to generate bad faith and even more disdain towards his channel because guys are like, well, who the hell is this guy? He's not one of us, really. He's not a Reddit community member. He's just coming in and he's trying to get his own stuff out there and he's trying to make money off of us or make a name for himself, but he's not willing to put in the work engaging with us and treating us like an actual uh, like community members. And so you got to make sure like you know some of these things like say Reddit for this example where you're getting in there, you're engaging with people, you're posting stuff other than your own and occasionally you're posting your own videos in there, but you're being careful about how you do it. You're trying to provide like the videos I post will only be ones that I know are going to possibly cause the most engagement, whether it's from controversy of what I'm saying or that it's going to just be sparking discussion. Or I even wait until I get some of my playlists done because I teach modularly where I want to have like something like knee bar defense. We're all going to start at the very beginning of basic knee bar defense stuff. And then by video 10, it's going to be much more elaborate. And I'm going to just do this big dump of content on the Reddit to be like, hey guys, here's a bunch of stuff. So rather than waiting for six months for me to upload all this content, here it all is now if you hadn't paid attention. And then people were like, oh sweet, this is a whole bunch of content. I'm okay with this versus me just spamming the feed every day with uh, my own videos. And uh, yeah, Reddit can be a very fickle bunch and it's important to know how these different little communities work. Yeah, I think you and I are both pretty heavily engaged on Reddit and it is I'm definitely- not as much as I should be. Like I- I, that's why I don't post very much is I only am I'm always reading Reddit, but I don't comment too often. And it's something that I do need to personally improve on if I want to be able to engage more with the guys there. Yeah, I've tried to step it up. I saw one of the mods on RBJJ say something like their target. If you want to be posting and self promoting your stuff is like a nine to one rule or something where they want to see nine more or less selfless posts from you where either you comment on someone's thread and you provide some value or you post something that isn't totally self-serving. They want to see nine posts like that for every one post that you do where you push your own blog or your own product. Uh, and that's totally understandable, right? Because nothing is worse on a system like Reddit than people who just, they, they show up, they post their spam and then they disappear and you never see them again. As someone who is pretty heavily engaged on Reddit, the one thing I found super interesting about the platform is how very quickly you can sort of develop a reputation on there if you're active because people will watch and they'll follow you. And I'm always surprised when I post a comment and then someone will follow up and say, hey, four weeks ago on this other comment, you said something similar. And I'm sitting there thinking, holy shit, you guys are really paying attention to everything I say to that level. Like the- Not much gets by them. Yeah, they'll the, the pick up crap real fast and they'll reward good behavior as well. Yeah, the community is really, really engaged there. So it's interesting because, man, if you want to get into content creation, I highly recommend looking into some of the stuff that Gary Vaynerchuk talks about because he's a, I mean, he's been in the game for a long time when it comes to content. And he talks about a lot of things like how if you want to get something out of people when you're creating content, you've got to be willing to give a lot first. Like you've got to be willing to put a lot of free stuff out there and provide a lot of value before you then go into self-promotion mode and start asking for money. The onus is on you to create that good faith before you can then go and you can start trying to monetize people. It's like, it's not like these people are going to like Home Depot to buy a hammer or something, right? (laughs) You know, there, there are a lot of content creators out there and asking people to get, to give you their money is a pretty big step. So you've got to be able to build a relationship first and provide a lot of value. And that means that when it comes to pitching your content and trying to ask for people's money, you got to be pretty selfless about it because otherwise, like you said on, you know, on Reddit, they'll eat you alive. People there can see through a lot of BS. There's a lot of very smart people there and you don't want to be in a situation where you are perceived as someone who is there only for your own gain rather than for contributing to the community. Yep. And that's where the growth mindset comes in. It's another thing to learn. When I was posting stuff, it was, I was wondering why certain things weren't catching on or why certain things are just getting downvoted into existence when for myself personally, I would objectively look at some of the content that I was creating was much better than some of the crap that catches traction online because there's a lot of crap on Instagram and YouTube, but it's not catching. And I would take that personally and I'd wonder what I'm doing wrong. And so with that, I would then research it. And then I start to see a little bit more about how everything works and what are the ticks of say something like the Reddit community and how things work when it comes to YouTube and how things are slightly different when it comes to Facebook. So that you just have the best chance of being able to 
succeed and even if you have good intentions of stuff and you're trying to put something out where it's, it's free content but at the same time you are still wanting to get people to watch your stuff and you're wanting them to subscribe to you because then it ultimately makes you more successful and makes you more well known there is still that a bit of a selfishness to that and so you got to be very careful with how you're approaching that yeah, I mean, that's a great point, right? From a self-serving standpoint, you think to yourself, well, this is free content. People should be happy to get it. But you got to look at it from the perspective of an audience, right? Content is more abundant than it has ever been in human history. Like if you want to find a jujitsu video, the question is not how do I find it? The question is how do I sift out of these millions of videos where I should even start? So just the fact that you're giving something away for free is not sufficient. It's got to be something that is unique and valuable and stands out from the pack. And that can be very, very challenging. I mean, I know that the thing that you guys do at Island Top Team on both your YouTube channel and on the online academy is you focus on a concept-based approach, much like we do. On our side, Matt and I, when we set this thing up, one of the reasons we went with the podcast and did the structure the way we did was because when you only have voice and I have to talk to people and I can't show them something, it puts a lot of restrictions on what kind of content we can do. I can't just crap out a YouTube video that shows me doing an arm bar, right? I've got to really think things through and be able to explain them in a concept driven way that can be communicated effectively through audio. And by doing this, we were able to find a very unique niche that I think a lot of people didn't exploit. So a big part of creating content is trying to find that unique value that only you can provide that stands out from the pack. Because to your point, you know, more is not always better. If you're just creating new tutorials that have already been done to death by people way more experienced than you who have a bigger platform than you, you're not really going to get heard. You're not really putting something unique out into the world. So it's not sufficient to just create more stuff. You've also got to find a way to position your stuff so that it fills a need that no one else is filling. That's so important. If you try to reach everybody, you will reach nobody. And so there are, like I said, there's a small community already when we're looking at the pool of people that we can have for potential subscribers on YouTube, just in general. So you take that pool. And then you take someone like me where, yes, my brand, my identity that I want to convey on my videos is that I teach a conceptual approach to jiu-jitsu. That if you watch one of Rory's videos on the RVV BGG YouTube channel, you are going to get a dense video that is packed full of conceptual information and high quality technique. That means that these videos are usually going to be four to sometimes 10 minutes long on a subject. And I'll have people that will complain and say, you know what, this was just too long. This could why couldn't you just make a one minute video that's just like on like the ones on Instagram? And I know that if I did some of that stuff, and I might try and do different variations of that stuff just to mix up content, but if I tried to rush that, then I'm not gonna teach it how I want to, to the quality that I have gotten used to want like how I like to learn and how I like to teach people. So I wouldn't be authentic to myself. And then I'm gonna also have other subscribers that like the content how I do teach it that then are not going to necessarily like that and so I do lose a portion of the audience where people don't want to watch these longer winded videos talking about this stuff but it's just for me how I like to teach and what I have for engaged subscribers already I want to be consistent to that and this was where I found as you had said this is the voice that I wanted to try and create to have something that differentiated myself from the pack because like there are conceptual people that teach well like Ryan Hall and John Danaher but they're not really uploading much on YouTube and somebody like Ryan Hall is one of the best I think when it comes to like the mixing of the teaching technique properly and teaching concepts well while also being an interesting presenter with the jokes he makes and just how he teaches where John Danaher takes it to the further extreme where he is like the best when it comes to being pedantic and explaining the very like complicated parts of techniques and breaking it down that beginners can even take something complicated and learn from it. But then because he's gone so far that direction, he's not a very interesting presenter to some people. And yeah, so there's yeah. people that are like, Oh, I, I can't watch John Danaher's videos. They're way too long or they make me fall asleep. And so then maybe I can fill a niche like that. Or Rob Bernanke fills a niche like that where, okay, you can get, a conceptual language like that but 
maybe Rory's more interesting to me personally, and maybe Rob Bernanke's more interesting to them than I am. Just in the same way that if you or Matt or anyone here listening decides to start teaching a conceptual approach, the humor you use, the way that you present, just the way that you look, I might have people that just be like, this guy's fucking face is too long. I can't stand the sight of him. I'm not watching this stuff. And so somebody else would be able to fill that niche for them where they're like, okay, I I like this person more. You're going to always gravitate towards these personalities that are the content creators. And it's why we get hooked to these different people where you have somebody, like you look at the technological market of just cell phones and stuff like that. And you got like Marcus Brownlee and Peter McKinnon and all these other guys, but you'll only usually watch one or two of them out of all these hundreds of people doing it. Even if they are smaller content creators, because you just, you like their personality, you like them, you want to see them do well and you get hooked on that person. Or like you watch somebody that plays a video game for a while. And then they move to a different video game that you don't even play, but I'll still be watching MTash play this game because I am interested in this content creator and his humor. And I just want to watch his content. I don't care necessarily exactly what it is at all times. Now, if you have a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu channel, then you want to be consistent in the sense that you are teaching Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You don't want to be just posting cat videos and stuff like that, uh, breaking it up because you'll be kind of losing what the identity of the channel is, but you can absolutely still teach some of the same stuff and still have people watch you. But yeah, if you're trying to cover cover heel hook information, good luck competing against like John Danaher and Gordon Ryan and Eddie Cummings and Lachlan Giles and Craig Jones. You got to find a different way to approach the scenario. Well, that's a really good item that I want to touch on before we wrap up here, which is how you target your audience and how you deal with the people that just don't like you. <laughs> because, mm-hmm. you know, to, to your point, you don't really want to try to make a product that's going to suit everybody. That, first of all, I don't think is really necessarily even possible. But second, it's also not really a great strategy. You know, it's better to make something that appeals to a certain group of people rather than trying to appeal to everyone. If you try to make something that appeals to everyone, you're probably going to wind up with something that is ultimately kind of watered down and maybe not really unique in any particular way. Now, you might get there as you grow and grow and grow. You might get to the point where you can expand your audience and your reach to the point where your product becomes very high appeal, broad appeal. But when you're starting out, it's much more likely that what you're making is probably just going to appeal to a small select niche of fans. And what I found and what I'm sure you found, and I think I can definitely see where you're going based on the feedback you've given here, is that when you put stuff out there, there are going to be a group of people who just don't like your product, or they might even just not like you personally. And they're going to be very vocal about it. And this is one of the interesting and challenging things about working online, right? Like, I mean, you know, as well as I do, if, if you walk into a seminar, like in person, and you teach 30 people some technique that you want, or some, you've got some game plan for the seminar, if people don't like it, and they don't like you, and they don't like your technique, they're not going to say anything. No one's going to interrupt the seminar halfway through and say, Hey, Rory, I don't like you as a person. I don't like these techniques. I think this is garbage. I don't think what you know what you're going to talk about. Like, no one's going to do that. First of all, because it's very rude. And second, because you're a black belt, so you'll kick their ass, right? But online, for some reason, because people are remote and somewhat anonymous, people are much more vocal about what they don't like to the point sometimes where it actually gets very toxic. And on one hand, as a content creator, This can be very demoralizing. But on the other hand, it's also probably one of the greatest opportunities you have to improve and to identify who your true audience is. Because, you know, you talked earlier about the importance of having a growth mindset and being able to collect and absorb feedback. Well, you're not going to get any more authentic, legitimate, descriptive feedback than talking to people on the internet. So you can get upset about that and demoralized about the fact that you have haters out there, or you can listen to them and make a targeted decision as to whether their feedback is valid and should be taken into consideration or whether, you know what, this guy, he might hate me, but he's just not my target audience. So that feedback, although it can be very, very vile sometimes, is also a gift because it gives you real direct insights that you probably wouldn't get if you were teaching in person. Yeah, fortunately, we're not ever going to be at like that stage, like some of these celebrities where you see like as a celebrity makes a mistake then they just end up getting bombarded with millions of death threats and all this other stuff. I can't imagine how toxic that shit is where people end up having to actually like delete their accounts and just get away from the internet. But for us, 
smaller community, we're going to have people that don't like us. I can count on a few certain individuals to follow me to certain forums and <laughs> videos and always be posting stuff. Fortunately, I also have people that will argue against them on my behalf. And so that's something that's been really cool. It's, as you said, it's very easy to get caught up in the negativity. Now, obviously, if I post a video and nobody likes it, everybody downvotes it, and everybody speaks out against it, maybe I cross the line and I'm going to have to evaluate that. But you're usually, usually going to get more likes than dislikes. And it is very easy, like even for myself, like uh, my Gordon Ryan guard passing series, there I have like 70,000 views on my first video. It's like 1,100 likes. And yet I still can see the amount of dislikes and it's nowhere close. There's only like one comment calling me a retard compared to the 150 great comments of people loving the content. And for some reason, a part of me still just gravitates straight to that negative part and goes, oh, crap, man, that kind of hurt for whatever reason. And so it's very important to, in the scheme of things, like it's old saying, sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me, which we have gotten far away from as a society, uh, accepting that. But you got to be tough to this stuff. And you got to just know that some of these people, like sometimes people will provide critical, constructive feedback that is actually useful. But most of the time people are just being morons. They're, they just don't like you for whatever reason. You can't please them. You're teaching it in a way that they don't like. It's just, yeah, live and let live and just move on with that. And you ignore them. I don't ever bother blocking or anything like that, but I've never had anyone trying to harass me or follow me around too much trying to like shit on the stuff that I'm posting. But you just got to be understand that you're not pleasing everybody and you got to focus on the good part, which are the people that are enjoying your content. Yeah, yeah. It is challenging when you get that really negative feedback. And I know that people have, you know, sent us some pretty vile messages that, you know, they kind of haunt me. Like it's, you know, people people can say very nice things to us and I appreciate it a lot. But man, if someone says something mean to us, you know, I might still be thinking about it like weeks or months later, right? And that's unfortunately one of the downsides to the internet. And it takes a really strong growth mindset to try to get something positive out of messages like that and if you're a content creator you're definitely going to experience this if you have any modicum of success so when you see those messages you have to first ask yourself well does this person have a point even if their delivery was very negative and not appreciated do they have a point and then second you have to identify well does it matter because in some cases they just might not be your target audience they might not be the kind of people that you're looking to to cater to and if you've got a situation where you know a small minority of people don't like your stuff but 90 percent of people are totally on board with it well that's probably an indication that you're doing something right so you have to take all of these variables into account i would say say though that if you're teaching online that particular relationship with super negative feedback is one of the things that is very different from trying to run a business or run a jiu-jitsu school and teach people when you're actually in the room with them yeah people like you said they are much less likely to ever say something to your face if you go and you screw up a seminar you probably just won't be invited back but that's all you'll probably hear about it. People are not good at conflict face to face and having these tough conversations, even if they are justified and they are done in a respectful and responsible manner. It's never easy to approach somebody and to let them know about one of their faults because you never know exactly how they'll react. But through the anonymity of online and just the distance of it, it and th I think it's really the disconnection just that it's not personal in the sense that you see this person in front of you, you see how you affect them. It's very easy to just type something out and hit enter and you'll not, you'll, you won't understand the impact, the negative impact that you potentially could have had on somebody. If we're talking just straight out like slander, hurtful stuff that you're putting out there, but it can be good in the sense that people can be more constructive and give uh, feedback that can guide you in the positive, uh, in the right direction that they're doing just over the keyboard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of the things that I learned pretty quickly early on here is you got to have pretty thick skin if you want to do this thing quite consistently. Well, you know, we're, we're over an hour here. I think this was a really awesome chat, Rory. Is there anything else that you want to add before we tie this up? That was really the main stuff. I just want to encourage people that if you have any inkling to want to get out there and create content, I know I waited years of thinking about wanting to create a YouTube channel and do that stuff before I actually got around to it. And if I had done that years before, I'd be more successful today than I am right now. And so you got nothing to lose. 
you will potentially uh, run into some hardships. You'll have a hard time being motivated. You won't be happy with the numbers. Set micro goals. Focus on smaller numbers of subscribers. Like look to hit that 100 subscribers because that's one of the hardest. The first 100 and the first 1,000 are the hardest. But then also focus on the things where like, are you seeing actual progress in yourself as an instructor, the way you talk to a camera? Are you getting a higher quality production? Because with that same phone, just by learning how to manually use it versus having automatic settings, you can get better footage. By learning how to actually use light properly, you can start to create much better footage. By learning how to use a microphone and take the time to edit your audio, you can create much better audio. So with basically the gear you already have, you can already progress so much more and create much better content that's just going to make you much more well-rounded and employable whether it's like aspects outside of brazilian jiu-jitsu but also within brazilian jiu-jitsu with some of the examples i talked about so get out there create some content and have fun yeah, I agree 100%. To someone who's done this myself, I mean, I, I have to say that doing this show has added a, like a new layer to my life that makes things so much more interesting. I never really thought that I would have as much fun and get as much value out of doing this podcast as I do. So I, I do encourage that if you have something to say, give it a try, right? It's very easy with the technology we have today to get things off the ground. And to Rory's point, I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at how much you learn and how much it actually actually benefits the other areas of your life that you didn't expect. So what's interesting, Rory, is, I mean, you're not one of our regular hosts, but you did actually talk a lot about a lot of the concepts that we talk about here on the show. Like you talked about having a growth mindset, which is something that we always talk about. It, your brain does kind of turn off to feedback and you kind of get it in your head that you're good at some things, but you're not good at others. And that's just the way it's going to be. But if you want to succeed online or actually at instruction in general, you've got to be very good at absorbing that feedback and taking it without taking offense and also understanding that you can get better at things. Um, you also talked about like how instructors, they lose their beginner's mind and they might be amazing at jujitsu, but they bleed that confidence over into their ability to teach and they don't realize that just because you're an expert in jiu-jitsu that doesn't mean you're an expert in instruction uh, you talked about continuous improvement how like you basically need to just keep getting back on the horse and getting better and better over time because like you mentioned your first episode probably is going to suck a bit and you also talked about consistency which is really absolutely essential when it comes to not just getting good at jiu-jitsu but also succeeding in online content I mean if you think that you're going to succeed on day one and things are just going to go amazing and you're going to have a million followers within a month. Like you're probably deluding yourself. I'm not going to say that that's never happened before. I know that sometimes it does, but the reality is it is much like with jujitsu. It is consistency that is going to allow you to build an audience and ultimately create a sustainable product. So if this is something you want to do, you've got to be ready to do it in the long haul. And that means that ultimately it needs to be something that you're passionate about. If you're just looking for quick gains, much like training jujitsu, you know, this approach probably isn't for you. So it's got to be something that really you're willing to stick through to the long term. Yeah. And don't be afraid to invest in yourself. So take time to spend uh, time on YouTube and what like there's so much free content out there. There is crap like in any area, but there's a lot of great information out there on how to learn more about YouTube algorithms and Facebook and how to create basic video content the different kinds of video content, learning more about your camera. And honestly, I've spent probably about like $1,500 Canadian on different courses to learn more about photography, to learn more about these things, video production, audio, et cetera. And I've never regretted it. There's been some courses that didn't quite give me everything that I wanted based on the money I had given to them for it. But review stuff, do your research and yeah, invest in yourself because this stuff will just keep building skills on top of skills and you're just going to be so much better at everything. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Rory. It was great to finally get you on the show. Um, before we go, is there anything in particular that you want to plug? I mean, I know, of course, that you've got the online academy and you've got your YouTube channel. Maybe you can tell our listeners how to find those. Absolutely. So BGJconcepts.net is the website that I do with my instructor, Rob Bernacki. And it's mostly his thing, but I am a partner and I help out with that and provide content. It is a Great resource to get that conceptual approach to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu taught in a very strong curriculum that's easy to understand and also help you be a better instructor. So, I mean, shit, fucking just take 
a one month membership, binge as much pedagogy stuff as you can and cancel it for all I care. But there's a lot of stuff there that can help you prepare to be better at putting this stuff on video if that's something that you're interested in. And then obviously, like I'm not teaching people how to be better instructors yet, or uh, I don't know if that's something I'll cover ever on my YouTube channel, but RVV BGG is my YouTube channel where I try and always focus on a conceptual approach to Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Awesome. Thanks, man. And of course, on our side, I mean, if you want to support us, you know, it's the patrons on Patreon who keep the lights on for us. So I can't tell you how much it helps us and helps keep the show going if you support us there. If you go to patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models, that's where you can support us. And we offer a whole ton of extra content on the Patreon, as well as the ability to connect with us directly through things like Discord. Again, that's patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models. You can also go to our website, bjjmentalmodels.com, where we have a database of all of the things we talk about here on the show. You can go to our store, pick up t-shirts, gi patches, and hoodies at bjjmentalmodels.com slash store. You can follow us on our mailing list at bjjmentalmodels.com slash join. And of course, you can catch us on Facebook and on Instagram as well. Thanks, Rory. I really appreciate that. I think that was an awesome chat. Um, I hope that if nothing else, this gives people a bit of inspiration and the tools they need to get their first foot in the door when it comes to creating online content. Because, yeah, to your point, I mean, I think people get intimidated by just how much stuff there is out there. But if you have something valuable to say, there definitely is still space for you. And I suggest that if, you know, as, as they say, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. So there's absolutely no harm. There's very little cost in giving this a shot. If it's something that you've always wanted to do, I hope that this is the bit of inspiration that you needed to start that journey. Awesome. Uh, thank you for having me, Steve. This was a lot more enjoyable than I thought it was going to be to have to talk to you this whole time. But, <laughs> well, that's because uh, Matt wasn't here, let's be honest. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Got the strongest member here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Talk to you guys next time. Take care, guys.